like I said, cyclical. There was a time where it was web first, that it was mobile first, and it was cloud first. You know, uh, so companies learn. But the thing that bugs me is that well, well, it's William Gibson, right? He said it. Um, the future's already here; it's just not evenly distributed. And what bugs me. everybody. Welcome to another Hoss Talks Foss. This is Matt Yankovic. I'm the Hoss here at Percona. Uh, today, we've got an extra special guest, uh, Robert Reeves from Liquid Base. Robert, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Thank you for having me. Ah, great to have you here. I'm really excited about today because I've been talking quite a bit about database design and the changing landscape of the database market. And knowing LiquidBase's place in that, um, I figure that this would be a great conversation for us to delve into some interesting topics. But before we begin, I'm hoping you could give us a little bit of your background because you are the CTO at LiquidBase. How does one become the CTO at LiquidBase? Well, it's it's actually really easy if you're one of the co-founders. Uh, oh, it's okay. it's the position you do. The co-founder you don't know what to deal do with. The uh, that person normally becomes CTO. <laughs> ah. So my my well, smart co-founder Pete he leads product. Okay. Um, and then the now now there's a distinction here though, because Liquibase the company was formed in 2012, but Liquibase the open source project was started in 2006. Ah, and that's by Nathan Voxland. So he is the project founder of Liquibase. He is benevolent dictator for life for Liquibase. And so, yeah, it's really easy to be CTO you, you, once you start the company and <laughs> you just give yourself the title. Well, so, okay. So how did you like come about starting the company? Like, like back in 2012 and did you start with liquid base, the project before you joined the company or did you join the company and then get your first exposure to the project? Well, it, it, it we found liquid base after we started the company. Okay. And so where this started is going back to the dewey days of 2009. And so I had started another company previous to Liquibase called Furnace with a PH. And it was a very early application server, Java application server deployment tool. So before DevOps. All right. So we started the company in 05 before that term really happened. And I am a recovering release manager. I, we used to call ah, it, okay. we used to call it software configuration management. Wow. What a horrible title. What a horrible title. Yeah. <laughs> it's going way back. It is so yeah. dated. And um, look, Larry Wall wrote in, uh, you know, his Pearl book, there are three virtues of a good software engineer laziness, impatience, and hubris. And I have them all. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was really struggling. I was at this company and we had a J2EE app and we needed to move it to uh, WebSphere and WebLogic. And I was maintaining two different sets of scripts. And I said, this is just BS. I hate it. Hate it, hate it, hate it. There should be an artifact that defines all the J2EE goodies I need, JMSQs, topics, all that stuff, all right, all the JDBC stuff, and know how WebSphere likes to be talked to, know how WebLogic likes to be talked to, and could roll it out to both of them. And so this company was deploying the software to uh, customers that had WebLogic or had WebSphere. And so um, I realized, oh my God, we need to fix this because again, lazy and impatient. Right. And uh, hubris, <laughs> thinking very, very highly of myself. I should be working on just scripts. I should be doing more value add because I'm, you know, amazing software configuration manager. We started a company and it worked. We wound up um, selling it to a lot of very large companies. And one of the large companies uh, in 09, I remember this conversation. It was summer of 09. And I was at 
I, I, I had customer success reporting to CTO at the time uh, over a furnace. Okay. And so it was our first seven figure deal. Ooh, and, that's always an exciting day. Yeah. So I went, I got on the play. That, that was, that was my baby. All right. Uh, also, we had just one other CS engineer, so we didn't have coverage. So I had to go. <laughs> ah, the pains of being a small company. Yeah. And so I went and they said, Robert, this is great. I love it. What are you doing about the database? And I said, oh, oh, that that's on the roadmap. It, it wasn't on the roadmap. <laughs> it's, it's, the narrator, oh, who's that? narrator say it wasn't on the roadmap. And so I asked them, I said, well, what's the problem? What are you trying to solve for? Let's talk, for, talk about that. And they said, look, prior to using Furnace, prior to speeding up our application deployment, right? See where I'm going with this? Um, we only updated... WebSphere once a week. And typically we have to have the DBAs run a SQL script to update the database. So the app will run, right? You, you've changed something in the app code that requires new buckets in the database, you know, little, little cubbies to put your data. Okay. Um, that was manageable when it was once a week. Then they started using Furnace. They started deploying every day, then sometimes multiple times a day. Sound familiar? Oh, uh, yes, yes. Continuous integration yes. and deployment. It's a great thing. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The Martin and Jez, thank you both. <laughs> but they, um, uh, uh, you know, I really thought about it. And, I, and, and this was right. BMC acquired Furnace. Um, and so uh, I've really been thinking about this and realized that, you know, DevOps was coming into its own. Um, mm -hmm. and I started to see the beginnings of, um, cloud was really taking off for, you know, a corporate IT perspective. And then also here comes this thing called microservices and containers. And all this stuff is accelerating how quickly, accelerating how fast we can get the apps out, but nothing for the database. And so Pete and I had said, Okay, we need to fix this. And he was employee number one over Furnace. So we're like, yeah, let's get the band back together. Let's do this. And while we were working on it, we came across Liquibase. And we said, ah, okay. shit. <laughs> There's open source that does this. Oh, my God. And we reached out to Nathan. We were like, Nathan, what do you say, buddy? What do you say? You know, uh, uh, we've got the peanut butter. You got the chocolate. Let's do this. And um you know, I really, the pitch to Nathan was, Hey, you want to work on your baby? You want to quit working for the man and, uh, work on this labor of love? Because remember, open source always starts with the developer having an itch that needs to be scratched. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, uh, we're like, let's help more people, dude. We're going to maintain open source. Um, we're going to have the community edition, but we're going to add features. We're doing open core. Um, and, uh, so far it's worked. Uh, and, and here we are, but that's, that's really how I got into it. That was my first foray. I've always been an open source aficionado, a fan, but I never really worked on a, a, a community, uh, before Liquibase. But now, oh man, I have drank the Kool-Aid. Oh, now, now, now you're a convert, right? So, you know, now, now, now you're here preaching the good word. Uh, so I interestingly enough, um, you know, back in the day when you were mentioning your, your Java app, I'm curious, what databases were you deploying on? Oh, well, see back then, this is early two thousands, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. and, and we had, um, we had four choices. So we had Oracle SQL server and DB2. And that's what we were deploying on because this, this was a transportation app. This was an app that helped uh, carriers figure out how to efficiently route their deliveries. I might have used that because back in the day, I worked at Penske Logistics. Okay. So I don't know. Maybe I was, maybe I used that app at some point or another or had to support it. Yeah. That. It's, uh, you know, it was uh, a little tiny company and it's not around anymore. Um, wound up getting uh, acquired by their customers. Um, but, um, you know, there was uh, rumblings about this new database 
this new like thing that you don't have to pay money for and you just get it. And sure, Postgres was always around, but it was MySQL. And that was the beginnings of it. Mm. And, you know, look, I've had a front row seat to what has happened with databases over, over the past couple of decades, I guess. And, uh, you know, back in the day, Liquibase only supported four databases. It, it was it mm. was MySQL, and then they had Postgres. Uh, so five early days, but I kind of stuck there for a while. And then when we started um, funding the community efforts and open sourcing it, we now have thirty three. Wow! What? Well, but isn't that indicative though of the database industry as a whole right now? Well, yeah. Is I mean, remember back in the day, right? Like it yeah. used to be. Oh, we're an Oracle shop. We're an IBM shop. We're a Microsoft shop. And you use their Absolutely. database. And you chose, <laughs> you didn't choose the database. Database chose you. <laughs> but now <laughs> we're using databases based on its impact on the application. Does it make sense to use Oracle? Does it make sense to use MySQL? Um, does it make sense to use something like Cassandra or? Uh, Mongo or something from one of our cloud friends. Um, we have graph databases. Um, we have so many choices now, and now we get to choose on what's what's best for the application, not based on who did the CIO play golf with most recently. <laughs> who did you play golf with most recently? <laughs> that, that, that'll dictate a lot. Uh, no, it's it's it is interesting because I think that the paradigm shift is quite substantial over the last you know ten years. Uh, when I was um, working at uh, the aforementioned Penske, for mm -hmm. instance, they were an Oracle <laughs> shop that just was reluctantly using SQL Server for a few applications. Mm -hmm. Right. And you're right. You, you negotiated a big contract with someone and that was it. It was that that's your stack. Yes. You're, you know, you might be a you might be a Visual Studio shop. You might be a Java shop. You might be. And you, you had the one database you had or maybe two. And that was it. And now, you know, because people want to move so fast, because there are so many microservices, because it's all about how quickly you can turn around and deploy you have these developers and everybody else who's picking the technologies that make the most sense for that particular application. And it's caused uh, an interesting explosion in not only the number of database technologies, but the number of individual databases people have to manage and support. Um, from an operations perspective, it's a little like the wild, wild west where, you know, you, you might have hundreds or thousands of individual databases, some small, some big, some, you know, all over the place, as opposed to one monolithic database system that everybody kind of dumps their data. Into. Well, hold on. Let's 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 explore the wild, wild west. I mean, if we're going to use that as an analogy, which I, I think it's a good one. All right. Let's think about the innovation that came out of the West. What technology did we get? because? We as a country were moving to the West railroad. Oh, I mean, telegraph yeah, the railroad. We, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, it, it's, we really figured out how do we, uh, our whole transportation infrastructure comes from that move West. And so, yes, somewhat lawless. Uh, <laughs> it's a little rough and tumble. Indeed. Uh, there's not, you know, uh, certainly, uh, you know, there weren't, you know, uh, amazing opera houses in Denver. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it was a tent where they just had a show as opposed to New York or Boston. And so you're right. There were things that are lacking, but I look at this and I say, is the problem that we can't manage it or is the problem that we're not allowing others to manage it? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point because I, I think there's a combination, right? Um, it's not that people can't manage it. It's the tooling hasn't caught up with the, you know, the the, the deployments in a lot of cases. Maybe. Right. Um, you know, like I think from uh, the perspective of the massive amount of databases out there, a lot of tools are still designed for 
simpler infrastructure, yes. if you will, or it might not be designed to work in a cloud native type environment. I mean, databases inherently haven't been cloud native until recently. And for some like Postgres or MySQL, it's kind of bolt-ons yeah. after the fact. Um, whereas a lot of these new databases that are starting to pop up that are quote unquote cloud native, uh, whether it's cockroach, Yugabyte, um, they're taking protocols that are from those databases that people love and use and mm -hmm. trying to make it cloud native from the very infrastructure up. So I think that there's work to kind of evolve where we are to kind of match the application paradigm doesn't quite match yet. But then there's also, you mentioned like, you know, will we let people manage it? The rise of the cloud says, yes. You know, you look at Amazon and how much they've invested in RDS mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, Microsoft and Azure and Google and their cloud SQL, you know, they're trying to make it so it is easier for people to have those fleets. But I still think that there is a gap because even if you're running on an Amazon or an Azure and you've got a large fleet of database servers, you still have to manage and maintain and you, you have to design things properly oh, from the get go. And I think that there's a false sense of security oftentimes with outsourcing or with, uh, you know, putting yeah. things in the cloud where, it, hey, it works. It's good. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I pay them to do it. Well, the old, you know, um, yeah, the old adage, garbage in, garbage out, that applies to the cloud, too. Uh, yeah. And you cannot just lift and shift. And not only have old architectures, but old ways of doing business in the cloud. You've got to change everything. And it's not the, the real value of the, of the cloud is the flexibility is that you can, this is an API that you can program to. Okay, cool. Well, let's treat it like that. We don't need a person sitting there care and feeding. It's not like back in the dot com days, you know, we had a, a person hanging out next in Sun E10K <laughs> massaging Oracle. <laughs> you know, it's just like, like it's like feeding it like a Wagyu beef, feeding it beer and, and soybeans and, and you know, just like taking care of it. But I, yeah. Martin Fowler talked about this with microservices. He, he, his, you know, blog post about this article, blog post, whatever the hell it was, where he really defines what microservices are. He talks about distributed data management. If we are going to allow our teams and encourage our teams to build it and run it themselves, they need to be complete masters of their own destiny. And so um, I think that by limiting their, you know, they can't touch this monolithic database. They have their own database. And whatever platform they choose, great, tear it up. I don't care what your stack is. As long as you maintain that web services API contract, we're good. We're good. Do whatever you want. But you mentioned the API kind of like the, the you know, the contract, right? Uh -huh. The SLA, if you will. It's it's interesting. This is the rise of the SRE and how important it is, because I think that from a uh, an API perspective, uh -huh. right? So you're giving people access to, you know, your your data and you're trying to give them, you know, some sort of like run it on your own. But there's an inherent assumption that things will perform, let's say, on par with what they would normally do. And when there's issues, whether it's performance or, you know, outages, if there are things that aren't working as prescribed or within norms, mm -hmm. then somebody has to become that detective. And I think that's the kind of the missing sauce in a lot of companies when they go fully into the cloud is, you know, that that person who um, or set of people who are looking into those those oddities. Um, and you're still managing things as as a group. But now, instead of having one person who's just taking care of, you know, the one thing, you see this rise of the SRE type, you know, persona where it's like, hey, if if something's not performing within the defined mm -hmm. parameters. I got to figure out why. Um, and that could be, you know, a uh, configuration. It could be a new deployment that was deployed that no one told people about. Ah, yeah. It could be, you Surprise! know, I, I mean, it, and that <laughs> happens a lot, right? Um, in fact, I, I went around and asked uh, Percona's customers a couple of years ago. I'm like, well, what's the number one thing that, you know, like you have a problem with that causes you the most issues? And they're like, oh, it's, it's code releases. Yeah. 
they're like, it's code releases because we don't know that they're going to happen now. They just happen. Yeah. And uh, all of a sudden something that was working, you know, perfectly fine, you know, two days ago is horribly broken today. Yeah. Well, and, uh, and it's going to increase know. in, in, in volume and amount. Uh, you know, oh, we yeah. have all bought in as an industry into DevOps. And so DevOps shows us that change is the enemy of stability. So let's have instead of these big, massive once a quarter releases, once a year, once every half year, you know, twice a year, let's have releases more often, little tiny releases. And so um, little change, little instability. And so let's do this and let's build the machine. Um, and we, there's got to be, we've got to, we've got to change this mentality that we really want a human involved in every single one of these things. Humans are really bad at rote, repetitive tasks. Oh, yeah. I'm really bad yes. at it. I'm the worst. <laughs> I, I get distracted like a hummingbird. And so, um, but I want to focus on the more interesting, creative problem solving aspects of my job. Not, you know, nobody wants to fill out TPS <laughs> cover sheets, right? Nobody wants to do that. No, 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 <laughs> no, no TPS reports for me. <laughs> and so I think, um, we've got to get to this point, um, where, uh, you know, we're just not worrying about it. We're just realizing that, hey, this is going to happen. You can't fight City Hall. This is this is happening. So make peace with it and figure out how you're going to respond. And what I've seen the rise of recently, and my friends at Adobe are doing this, and I'm so proud of them. I'm not seeing the DBA title anymore. I'm not seeing database administrator. I'm seeing yeah, it's going away. database reliability engineer. I'm seeing DRE. And oh yep. man, I love that. I love seeing that. Yeah. Yeah. I think the rise of the database uh, reliability engineer coincides with the site reliability engineer, oh, right? Of course. Um, database always yeah, lags. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, always. <laughs> but um, it, it's the same with the cloud, right? So I remember I would spend months preparing for an upgrade, you know, with Oracle, mm -hmm. right? You, you would you would test it. You would make sure the backups were there. You would do this. You would do that. And now, you know, with a lot of cloud uh, providers, an upgrade is automatic. Yeah. Right. It's behind the scenes. About time. Um, you, you know, and sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Um, because we can get into a whole, you know, issue with all the automation issues we still need to solve. <laughs> but let's put that aside for a second. But now... It, it's a waste of time to spend a ton of time on, you know, maintenance type activities like backups. Yeah. You know, did the backup work? Yes or no. That's all I really care about. Mm -hmm. It worked. I can restore it. Okay. It just happens behind the scenes. I don't need to check yeah. it every day. I don't need to, you know, that's good. I want to automate that as much as of possible. Of course. Um, but it's those oddities like i mentioned right and this is this is where the whole rise of the observability keyword you know like like if you know you're 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 doing the uh the buzzword cloud right now observability is pretty pretty big in the the buzzword mm -hmm. cloud because you've got so many of these uh databases out there you've got so many of these systems out there it's how do you find you know how does one person manage you know 50,000 things that are automated and then find the one or two that are causing mischief and oftentimes it is the small things that cause a lot of mischief, not necessarily the big things, yes. you know, especially when you're doing continuous deployments, yeah, right? Butterfly theory. You know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and you look at a lot of these cloud outages we've had over the last couple of years, and a lot of them come back to like one configuration change. Well, sure. Right. Like, you know, it's just one little tiny thing. Oops. I, I changed, you know, um, you know, the subnet or something mm -hmm. crazy and like everybody went offline. Yeah. It's always you know, DNS. So. It's always DNS. <laughs> yes, yes. DNS is always at fault. It's always DNS. Guaranteed. No, yeah. Or Cloudflare, right? So <laughs> something you know, like cash. That. But <laughs> you know, it, it's <laughs> remember going back to you know Agile Manifesto, and and I'm, I'm dating how freaking old I am. Uh, but going back to Agile Manifesto, we also saw the first implementation of that that I saw 
was extreme programming. And, and so early 2000s. Mm-hmm. And so all the books, you know, the X was capitalized. This is back when everything was extreme. I think we were listening oh, yeah. to a lot of, um, you know, uh, um, rap metal, uh, extreme Doritos, ex- extreme everything. <laughs> It's like we go through phases. Yeah. We go through phases of society. But uh despite its wacky naming, uh, extreme programming, I really like what they their the approach was. And I really forget the the original the originator of the idea. And and I apologize for that. But the theory was if testing is good, let's do it all the time. If code reviews are good, let's do it all the time. And so that that was pair programming with extreme programming. Uh, if testing, well, you know, this was, you know, around the same time as test-driven development. Before I write code, I'm going to write a test to tell me if I've done the code correctly. And that's actually how we do it at Liquibase when we expand other databases, how we were able to quickly validate support for Percona Extra DB cluster. Because we had all the test cases. And and thank thank you, Percona, for building it on top of MySQL. We were able to leverage that. But having these tests, having these code reviews, um, you know, if continuous, if integration is good, let's do it all the time. Martin Fowler started that with CI. And so I think if releasing is good, we should do it all the time. If automation is good, we should automate all the things until we need a human, because you're always going to need your Columbo in SRE, DRE land (laughs) to figure it out what happened. (laughs) And so, you know, instead of fighting it, I really would like to see more companies embrace it. I would really like to say, and, and you know what? It's not at the technical side of the house. It's certainly not the newer, you know, younger folks, you know, uh, uh, you know, handful of years experience. They're bought in. It's management. Yeah, it's leadership. And so I really would like to see them just say, hey, man, look, let's do this. Instead of just saying, well, we've got to do it how we did it in 2003. Like, come on, really? Really? Well, the good news is eventually, like, you know, it's all cyclical. So today's new programmers will eventually become tomorrow's managers. Mm-hmm. Um, how we can accelerate the process, though, I, I think is the question, right? Because I think that there is a lot of value out there. And the good news is I've seen a lot of companies start to, like, develop their own um new teams around whether it's you know the 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 philosophy of automation or devops i mean you you know it is it is very trendy right Mm -hmm. now and i think that um the laggards are starting to come around especially because you start to see analysts talk about it right yeah i know that there are some companies who don't move without gartner telling them where they should move to yeah bless unfortunately bless their heart right (laughs) yeah well yeah yeah right yeah yeah (laughs) um but and and so it is a little bit laggy and so there's a lot of you know let's be honest devops is not new anymore it it's established it's there you should be using it you should be using automation uh but uh you know a lot of us uh are are looking at the next thing or the next thing right yeah and um i think it's uh it's important to know that it is is out there and right now I, i gotta say i don't know of any new application that isn't being designed with that automation in mind with that kind of uh, cloud native uh, microservice architecture. Well, it's just, I, I don't, I don't think people are developing new applications that way. If they are, it's very rare. Well, it is, in my you opinion. know, it, it, look, like, like you said, cyclical, there was a time where it was web first, that it was mobile first and it was cloud first, you know? Uh, so companies learn, but the thing that bugs me is that, well, well, it's William Gibson, right? He said it. Um, the future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And what bugs me, yeah, what bugs me is that there are these teams, there are these pockets of greatness in these larger companies. But there are still people on, and this is not, you know, a slur on the legacy apps. Meaning 
<laughs> the, the legacy is a good thing. <laughs> it's leaving yeah, a legacy yeah. as a, a human, you know, Carnegie, that that's a good thing. Uh, but if you uh, or Carnegie, however you pronounce it, whatever. Um, but uh, those legacy apps throw off so much revenue, billions of dollars for these companies. And it pains me that they're just nibbling around the edge on the newer apps and not figuring out how... Now, there's some companies that have figured it out. There are some companies that have figured out, how do I take this old busted j 2 E app? And as I'm continuing to improve it, I am refactoring it on the fly and peeling off functionality into microservices. I'm using the expand contract, expand contract migrate um, uh, pattern to add microservices and move people out. That, that's cool, man. That that's good, but not everybody's doing it. And I'm just thinking about all of the happy hours, birthday parties, you know, piano recitals, fishing <laughs> that's being missed because somebody's dealing with this stupid crap. It's terrible. But it's job security for a lot of people. Uh, and that's the that's the problem. Hey man, right? it's 2022. Nobody's worried about job security right now. Oh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> so, you know, true story. Okay, true story. I actually um worked with a company not too long ago, um, big company, Fortune 500 company, where they wanted to modernize their internal IT systems. Modernization is a big topic, right? Sure, you know, everybody it's fun. wants to modernize. New CIO yeah. wants to modernize. Great. Of course. <laughs> well, and this is where politics and not the politics of the country mm -hmm. or government dictate so much at a lot of, lot of companies. Yeah, this is a people problem. Um, this is a people problem. This company in, you know, brought in new management and they're like, we're going to go all in on open source databases. We're going to go all in on this new stack, this new framework. Mm -hmm. And so they actually put financial incentives on the management team to hit certain goals. We want this many applications migrated. We want this many, you know, Oracle to MySQL migrations, all this stuff because they wanted to modernize and they wanted to make it, um, you know, uh, uh, more cost effective and more efficient. And the teams that supported the legacy applications, they, they, how the teams were structured was this application, this business unit mm -hmm. was in this space. They're like, we have no incentive because their management was different than the yeah. infrastructure management team. Yeah. And so they just said no. And a year later, that entire management team was gone. Yeah. And someone new came in with a brand new stack and a new idea. Um, you know, and, uh, you're right. And, uh, you know, it, it's one of those. One of those weird things that a lot of our choices and decisions are dictated by, like you said, the team in management, the team in power, the you know the new people coming in um, who have some sort of decision making, and they can you know change or attempt to change a cultural overnight. Mm -hmm. But if they don't have the buy in of the development teams and of those actually supporting them, uh, it's a it's an uphill battle. Well, in a lot of cases. this is how I would have approached the problem. All right. And, and this is where uh, and this isn't my idea. I've seen seen this success sex, successfully done at many, many companies is to not change the stack and to say uh, you have to offer services and you have to guarantee performance of those services. And so instead of this app is not a microcosm, um, you have a connection to another application. Right. So maybe, you know, let's imagine it's a bank and you've got uh, the team that does uh, investments, wealth management, whatever. <laughs> but they need to connect to uh, the single sign on. And so the single sign on folks are going to offer their identity management to the wealth management folks. OK, cool. All right. Here it is. You know, here's the API. This is what we're using. Um, but at the same time, I want to be able to put little widgets on the main homepage, which is the consumer side. 
And I need those widgets of account information, those sorts of things from the wealth management folks, from the investment folks. So you're going to offer that to me as a service. And um, that's that's going to happen. Make peace with it. I don't care how you do it. And I would have put incentives on them to do it. And then once it started happening, I would measure the response time uh, and rate of you know, the, the performance of the application of the services they pushed out and constantly seek to improve them. So last quarter, you were X. We're trying to get better than X this quarter. Okay. And then um, also measure them on what uh, Dr. Forsgren, Dr. Nicole Forsgren, she's done a huge amount of research. She wrote Accelerate with uh, a bunch of other folks. And um, they... Uh, there were four key DevOps metrics, and that's what I would hold them accountable to. I would hold them accountable to number of releases to production. I don't care about dev and test, just production. Number of releases, um, the success of those releases, um, the uh, mean time to recovery. So when something bad happens, how quickly do you get back? And um, then... Uh, oh, my God, I cannot believe I'm blanking on the fourth. I'm having a Rick Perry moment. Um, but, <laughs> but having those four metrics and then also laying out, it sounds like, a, uh, in, in the example that you cited that incentives weren't aligned and when you're not incenting people, you've got a, a whole who moved my cheese issue and, and you can't fight that. Like, like you might win against city hall. You ain't winning against that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and it, it's it's a challenge for a lot of larger companies that have those politics at play. Even smaller companies end up with politics. And I, I mean, I've seen this numerous times. And uh, one of the problems that plagues the open source space is a lot of companies in the open source space um, provide services as a primary vehicle for uh, their revenue streams, right? So they'll offer support or managed service, consulting, those types of things. And um, in the case of um, teams, a lot of them will say, ooh, I want support because I value it, or I want the, the enterprise version if it's open core because I value it. And then someone changes from a, you know, like, you know, they bring in some new DBA or a new, you know, mm -hmm. whoever, and they're like, I would never pay for that because it's open source. And then they end up migrating off of the enterprise version to a, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, community version. And then a year later, they leave and someone else comes in and goes, oh my God, why aren't we using the enterprise version? And so I've seen this kind of ping pong back and forth. And I think a lot of companies have uh, that mentality and they they end up just not being able to move forward. So I, I think it's a big problem. But oh, it's uh, huge. I agree with Dysfunction. you. Dysfunction. Very definition yeah. of it. Dysfunction. Oh, but I agree with you. The incentives have to be there. Absolutely. I, I, the, it, it just hit me. The last DevOps metric was lead time. So when Developer checks a code and then it's out in production. Sorry. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um, and I think all of this ends up getting tied back, you know, to, to the database because, you know, I, we mentioned like database is so foundational for all of this. And, and uh, honestly, it's not all that for a lot of developers, it's not interesting. It's not as interesting. So we don't see the innovation from uh, from them on the database side. A lot of these companies that are designing these new databases are, are picking up the mantle for some of, you know, moving the ball forward. Mm -hmm. But um, there's a lot more developers working on app code who just don't want to think about the database as much. They just want to plug it in and let it ride. Yeah. Which means the automation really speaks to them if they can just use it as a service. Um, if they don't need to think about it and it just happens, that's awesome. Yeah, good. Look, I want developers focusing on solving really hard business problems. And if we can make it easy for them to get their changes out, to make it a non-issue on the platform, it's always going to be available. That is a good thing. Um, there was a time, you know, we say, well, not everybody, maybe people my age say, you know, refer to things that always have to be up as dial tone. It's an old dude saying, um, but there, <laughs> most people don't even remember dial tone, know, right? Uh, but <laughs> yeah, scary. Yeah. Uh, uh, for the kids that are listening, there was a time where you would pick up a phone and it would make a sound saying that it was ready to be received numbers to be dialed. Um, 
there was a time where dial tone was not expected. <laughs> it's like, oh, the phone's working. That's a good thing. Uh, because you had people involved. You had those, those you know, switch operators. Were, yeah. The- yeah. You would call yeah. up and somebody would manually connect your call. And especially if you were doing long distance, you would have to go, you know, LA to Washington, DC. You would actually have somebody would have to plug in wires to connect this. And, 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 and it was a mess and it was a pain. But then we got automation. We got automatic switching, which totally changed how we communicate as a country. Um, we disintermediated the switch operators. Now, switch operators, they were incented, right? I don't want this automation. I'm going to lose my job. Yeah. But then they go and they wind up being the people that installed the switches. You start seeing the rise of the telco engineer. Instead of somebody who was just manually plugging in and pulling out wires, they're actually going and installing this stuff. So we start seeing an increase in value add for that telco employee and also how much they're making. They wind up learning more. They're more valuable to the organization, but they're also making more money. There is an incentive to learning new technology and automation. So this, but humans don't like it. The individual has has a real hard time saying, wait a minute, this impacts me negatively. And as a species, we tend to veer to the negative. What's the worst that could happen? And not really focus on, well, what is most likely to happen and is that good? It reminds me of a, a commercial. Um, I don't know. You, you, I don't know if you've ever eaten at Quiznos Subs. I'm familiar with the place <laughs> and what they do. There, <laughs> there used to be this commercial long ago. I think you can find it on YouTube. Uh-huh. And they, they they said, you know, hey, they had the first toasted subs. And um, there were these uh, kind of uh, Neanderthal people wandering around. And it's like it's like the first guy who invented pants. Yeah. And they all had bushes in front of them and behind them. And like this guy walks out with khakis and what are those? You know, it's like they're pants. And one guy goes, I fear change. I will keep my bush. And he runs away. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, that's kind of what it is, right? It reminds me of that. Yeah. And, and that's uh, that is never going to change, whether it was the move from mainframe terminals to client server, client server to web, um, moving from on-prem enterprise software to SaaS. Um, these were big moves and the same conversation that we're having was had back then except Absolutely. it was what in in the in the letters to the editor section of PC mag is that <laughs> you didn't have podcasts you didn't have that yeah that's right yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was on usenet <laughs> yeah usenet well, water cooler discussions you know um, yeah bulletin boards back then yeah, yeah. yeah. but it, yeah. but here's the thing i'm hoping that we have learned and we're starting to accelerate and i think the key to that is open source at the end of the day that is where um that 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 you know marketplace of ideas has proven out to be far far more valuable than anything an individual or an individual company could come up with. And in crowdsourcing, really, you know, and you mentioned being lazy. I don't look at it as lazy. You just want to do a, you, you want to find a better way. And from an open source perspective, yeah. you see a problem. And this is part of the power of a lot of the, the projects that uh, we work with. You see a problem and it doesn't quite solve it. You want to go fix it. So you don't have that problem anymore. Well, that's hubris. That's the pride right? part of it. It is. It is. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, but, you know, and I think that's the the interesting thing. It's a different paradigm shift from a lot of uh, developers because yeah. they're used to, I have a goal in mind, I have a target. And then if I hit my target, my boss is happy and great, but they're not really invested. This sure. puts investment, you know, for people into the project because it's like, yeah, I really don't want to spend my time doing this, right? I'd rather just to have it automatically yeah. happen behind the scenes. Well, yeah. 
Yeah, just check out threevirtues.com and because that is where they have those three virtues from Larry Wall and they describe it. It's just one page on the website. Mm-hmm. And um, it is, uh, oh, it's phenomenal. Um, it, it's so good. And I just really wish we would get faster as an industry of recognizing that. So for us at Liquibase, when we look at the community, we for we view community requests as an indicator of areas that we need to beef up on the paid offering. So when people start um, saying, well, things like, okay, well, I want to be able to have Liquibase reach out to Vault or CyberArk to get my authentication information, username and password. Um, you know, what we did is that we we added an extension framework. And so we first enabled other people to do this. Like, okay, you want to do this? Here is a way of doing that. Instead of getting into the code and, and, and hacking the monolith, the core, well, just add this extension. And then what we've done is based on that feedback, we have added extensions to our paid offering. And so we're enabling people to be able to do it themselves. We're never going to stop people. We're never going to un-open source things or change our license model. We're Apache 2.0, about as free as you can get. And we are going to, um, you know, we're going to look at that stuff and say for our larger customers, we're going to help them out and they're going to pay for that, that assistance we're providing them. But we look at that community as a way of telling us where, you know, where's the puck going? Where do we need to skate as opposed to lagging indicators? And I think that right there is why the community is so valuable. It's not just free code. That's lame. What's really valuable about it is that you get these ideas for people that might not be paying customers and just have a problem. And that sharing that information, that information, that little nugget, that morsel, so yeah. valuable. So yeah, and I think that's a big mistake a lot of open source projects and companies make is they attribute contributors only to code. And um, the yeah. most valuable contributions are feedback and, you know, ideas. Evangelism. Oh, my God. I just used this open source project and it's yeah. so good. And I got to that baseball game with my kid. Yeah. <laughs> You know, that is more valuable, I yeah. would argue, because, you know, they tell one person, another person tells two, other person tells two, so on and so forth. You got exponential growth. And remember this, you know, the 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 platonic ideal of this is, you know, the Linux kernel. And you see uh, Linus just reaching out on that Minix subgroup on Usenet. Back in the day, hey, I'm working on this thing. What do you think? And start getting people to provide feedback. It wasn't the code. He wanted yeah. feedback. Yeah. And I think that's that's the the that's something that I think a lot of people don't quite understand about it. But uh um Robert, I hope that we can get you out to Percona Live this year. I know it's right there in Austin, so it's just down the street from here. It's right down you the know, street we're, we're for really me, man. Hoping you'll, you'll come out and see us. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to thank you for coming on out, talking to us a little bit about uh, DevOps automation, a little bit about LiquidBase, all things databases. Um, appreciate the time here. Um, it was great catching up. Well, of course. And look, I, I <clears throat> the answer, <clears throat> excuse me, the answer is yes. I'll be at Percona Live. And if anybody uh, wants to chat about this, um, I'll be around and it's really easy to find me. Um, you can blow me up on Twitter at Robert Reeves, uh, find us at Liquibase. And we've got a ton of good stuff out there to help our database brethren in the trenches. And, um, you know, the stuff is free. It's open source. You don't have to pay us a dime. It just breaks my heart to know that people are still doing this manually. So. We'll help for free too on our Discord chat. We'll so do check this. out Robert over at Liquid Base, and uh, you know, check out the open source project that they've got going on, and uh, maybe there's some awesome things that you didn't know you could do that you might be able to do if you uh, check it out. So, 
Robert, thanks again and appreciate you hanging out. Thank you. Wow, what a great episode that was. We really appreciate you coming and checking it out. We hope that you love open source as much as we do. If you like this video, go ahead and subscribe to us on the YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And of course, tune in to next week's episode. We really appreciate you coming and talking open source with us.